Hello and welcome to episode 29 of Tall Guy Talks Travel with Rick Dockerty. Today we're going to take a trip back to the past of Walt Disney World with Steven from A Life in the Parks. Steven's YouTube channel is filled with old video footage from the parks. It's always great to talk about the way the parks used to be as we look forward to how they continue to grow. Before we get started, please like, subscribe, and comment. Also, share this show with your friends who love Disney, Universal, and travel. Remember, I am an authorized Disney travel planner and my services are always 100% free to you. Just $200 can lock in your next Disney vacation. I also spend a lot of time focusing on Universal, Las Vegas, New York, and I can help you plan your next trip almost anywhere in the world. Please contact me at rick at eartotheirtravel.com, rick at eartotheirtravel.com, or call 727 727- 507-3123, 727-507-3123. As I said, it will never cost you a dime to use my services, and I may even be able to save you some money. Next week, Sarah from Seattle and I will be at Disneyland. I know all of you are going to want to follow along with our adventures. I will have pictures, videos, blogs, and live streams from Disneyland and Disney's California Adventure on my social media pages. I'm always bringing you that type of content from Walt Disney World and Universal Orlando Resort. Please check out my pages, facebook.com slash ear to their Rick. Twitter.com slash Rick underscore ear, Instagram.com slash Rick ear, the number two there, and Twitter.com slash TGTT podcast. It's time to get things started with Stephen, who's connecting with us from the United Kingdom. How are you doing today, Stephen? I'm very well, Rick. And you? I am doing excellent. I absolutely love following your YouTube channel, A Life in the Parks. And I just wanted to have this opportunity to talk about it. And I know that my listeners would also love to check out some of these videos. So first, why don't you describe to somebody who hasn't visited your site what you do on your site and why it's so unique? Um, I think to, to start off with, it's that whole of history of, of the theme parks and uh, and how they've changed over the years. Like I was quite lucky that uh, I first went to Orlando in... 1985 uh, we had a great family trip um, and just fell in love with the place um, and then sort of four years later um, it was my parents 25th wedding anniversary MGM Studios had just opened and we went there and it was just fabulous uh, my mum's boss had said to us I've got this camcorder and you can imagine it it was like a brick yeah my dad was dragging around um, and, and recording sort of our our time at Disney. So, um, yeah, my, my, my channel is basically from that trip in 1989, then sort of fast forward a few years when I went as an as adult. Um, and really it's from the, the millennium and all those sort of celebrations right the way sort of the next sort of 10 years. And um, I've, got, I've got about 80 videos up so far of not just Orlando, there's California as well, uh, videos from there. And I've probably got about another 40 um, sort of old retro um, videos still to add on my, on my site. The time frame that you're talking about is very interesting because that's almost exactly the time frame for me. I went my first time, I think it was 1985, 1986. I was a very, very small child. <laughs> and then I went pretty consistently through 1993. So I got the very beginning of MGM Studios as well. And then I had a little bit of a gap until I became an adult, much like you. So we have a similar timeline into our love of Walt Disney World and our love of these theme parks so as you're going through these old videos and you look at some of the changes that have happened to the parks what are some of the things that you really miss the most bizarrely it's things like um walking around world showcase and it not being a food festival the whole time like it's unbelievable it, wouldn't you just want to go around there and it just be normal and, and i put a video up not that long ago and it's like it's so changed that that park um, over the last few years. Um, you look at MGM Studios now. I've got a video that will be coming out shortly in which the the backlot tour did the whole catastrophe canyon, 
and then it comes up the streets of America. And well, that didn't do that for hasn't done that for a long time. Um, and that was it was a, a movie studio. You, you felt there, and um, I think when we went that the first time, they were doing like Turner and Hooch and things like that, and you could see all the costumes and. You, you really felt that whole sort of, I'm here and I'm seeing how it's going to be made. I'm from the UK, you know, there's a big history of, um, of, of movie here, but it's not really like it is in the States where there was just that sort of, that, that excitement that we had. Um, and yeah, and obviously the, the, the Magic Kingdom hasn't changed as much, um, but yeah, the, the, there's been some changes there. I think the other thing is, is that, how the, the development of things like the parades, like you had these, at one point in the early 2000s, all four parks had parades. It was just a, a very special time. Um, and, I, and I kind of miss that. Maybe that more will come back after the, the pandemic's over. But it was that um, MGM, they, they were changing their parades every couple of years for, for a while. Um, and I do, I, I miss that sort of that live, um, in, in terrain, sort of interactions that made Disney different to other theme parks. So as we talk about that original MGM Studios and when that park and when that park first opened and some of the things that would seem so weird to somebody now who knows Hollywood Studios but didn't know MGM, and I'm thinking of two things in particular – that were huge at MGM studios at the beginning that barely get talked about at Disney at all anymore. And that's who framed Roger rabbit and Dick <laughs> Tracy. Remember how big Dick Tracy was? I knew, I knew you were going to say Roger rabbit. It is. That is what that whole, that whole character is just, um, I actually watched somebody else's video. I watch a lot of other people's retro videos. Um, and it was a parade, and so in the Magic Kingdom, and Roger Rabbit is the first character out of the box, and you're thinking, "Wow, when was the last? I don't remember the last time." And Dick Tracy, exactly the same. That that film was huge. It was everywhere, and then it was nowhere. Both of those <laughs> movies, everywhere, and then nowhere. All of a sudden, there are still some references to Who Framed Roger Rabbit. I think there are actually five references to the movie scattered throughout. Walt Disney World. Oh, wow. There's the Maroon Cartoons billboard in Hollywood Studios still. Above Hollywood and Vine Restaurant in Hollywood Studios, there's Eddie Valiant's office. And there's an outline of Roger Rabbit busting through the blinds. At Pop Century Resort, there's the big Roger Rabbit. In casting, there is a statue of Roger Rabbit, which not a lot of us see. But I've no, been no. told by CMs that that exists. And his footprints are also at Hollywood Studios. Love it. So that's a little bit of an interesting bit of trivia on Who Framed Roger Rabbit. But Dick Tracy has been gone. I think they do have the movie on Disney Plus now, but that's about it. That's like the only reference they have to it anymore. And it was everywhere. So if you took a gap after those first few years of MGM Studios and didn't go back until you were an adult... Is that when you first got to experience Disney's Animal Kingdom? Yeah. Uh, what happened was, is that during the 90s, life got in the way. Uh, I went to college. Uh, I met my partner. We bought a house. Um, I, I wanted to go back in 98 for the opening of Animal Kingdom, but we were just we just couldn't save up enough money. Um, and then, yeah, in, in 2000, it was, let's go back. Um, and the, the, tape, the VHS tape that my dad had, we had watched that to death. There's no YouTube. There, there was no way of actually seeing um, that theme park footage. Um, my other half, she didn't want to go at all. I cannot... It, and, and look at her now is completely different. Like she loves it. But I said, I want to go on vacation. I want to go to Orlando for two weeks and we go to theme parks. She must have thought I was nuts. And it was such a hard sell. I'm this can we go for a week? And it's like, not really. There's there's so many theme parks there. We also want to go to Kennedy Space Center. We want to go to Busch Gardens and, and sort of the beaches. And there was there's so much sort of going on. Nowadays, when people say they're going to go um, there for two weeks 
and they say, can I do it all? And you're thinking, you can't do it all in two weeks anymore. That's completely changed. And I think that for, for British tourists, there was a time when it was this whole, um, it's a once in a lifetime experience. It's a lot of money to go to the, the States of the best of times. And people go there and they get bitten by this bug. And it's amazing to, to see how that has grown. Because when, when I was going in the, in the 80s as a kid, no one, threw, I, I was the first person, yeah, luckily through my dad's job, um, yeah, they had a big social club and we managed to go. And even sort of in the early 2000s, it had just started to become that much more popular. You were seeing more sort of, yeah, Brits turning up. But yeah, it was that dream sort of destination for us. I know sometimes I'll be talking to clients and I'll ask them, how long are you thinking about going? And they will say, well, we want to see everything. So how long will that take? <laughs> and I always say to them, I started going to the parks when I was five years old. I'm 41 now. For the past few years, I go at least once a week. I'll tell you when I've done everything. <laughs> <laughs> and it, one of the things I get a lot and during those sort of 2000 to 2010, we were doing two trips of at least sort of two weeks each going to Orlando. We would then also have like city breaks. So we would go to New York or we would go to Vegas. Um, occasionally we would sort of extend and we would go to California and do the parks there. And people would say to me, don't you get bored doing the same things over and over again? And it's like, no, it changes so much and we, we've got friends and and they look at sort of my old videos and they say that's how i remember the parks now and you, i have to say look at that enjoy it it's not like that anymore you know, this has changed it you know it changes so frequently and i'm all for it you know it, it's it's nice for things to as long as they get better of course yeah i won't mention test track <laughs> i don't know what that was all about so I think you're referring to the original test track being a lot better yeah. than the new one. I agree I with you. The, yeah, I, tell you, I, I think that the, the, the old theming was was really good. And sort of I, I had that, um, that that feeling of Epcot, it was quite educational. And they, they, they didn't sort of have all the characters, did they? And it was – and I preferred that there was a bit of that to it all. Um, World in Motion, I loved as a as a – the ride as a kid, but yeah, it had, had its day. I think it needed a bit more excitement in that park. Um, but yes, yeah, so some of the re-themes have not worked as well for me. Um, I'm not particularly a fan of the uh, Three Caballeros. I was a big fan of the original um, ride in there. Um, if they turn that into Coco, yeah, I would love to see that too. So yeah, I, I, I like some of the things as they used to be and also things that yeah, that they make better, shall we say, the old plus in that they used to do back in the day. I definitely think that the parks do have to change because you see the excitement that happens when something new comes to the parks. And we might not always click with every change that's made. It might not work for us as individuals, but some of those changes, it's not our demographic. All the no, people who complain about Maelstrom leaving the Norway Pavilion for the Frozen Ride it's probably not there for you. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I agree with that. And to be honest with you, that's the type of thing that Disney can do. It's relatively, let's be honest, it's cheap and the kids will love it. So why not? Yeah, it, as long as the changes are for the better, I'm all for it. Um, I've actually got the video for Journey Into Your Imagination, that, that, that short sort of two-lived year, year mistake of, of taking out Figment from his own ride. It was bizarre. Um, and I've had so many comments on that video of just people saying, I can't believe how bad this was. And it's like, yeah, it was a terrible ride. You know, wh what were people thinking? Um, but yeah, it, Disney have made some mistakes, but some of the new things coming down the pipe, I can't wait for Tron. Um, Due to the, the situation, I've not managed to go back since 2019. Um, so I've not done things like Rise of the Resistance. I've not done Mickey and Minnie's. So um, there, there's some new things that have happened that I'm, I'm quite happy to see as well. Um, Galaxy's Edge, amazing. Pandora, just love it. You know, th th Those things are proper 
improvements to, to what was there before. I want to go back to journey into your imagination for just a second. <laughs> I haven't checked your site yet. Do you have any of the original Figment ride? I don't know that that was uh, my the, the original uh, footage was recorded by my father, who was much more of showing what the parks look like. I don't suppose back then too many people thought I oh, will film the actual ride and I'm not quite sure how good VHS would have been um, on that ride anyway. But I, I've seen sort of, um, of other people's footage of that ride. Check it out. It, the original is, is it was a classic. I'm, I don't know why it was ever changed. It's so hard somebody our age who's been going to the parks as long as we've been going to them to try to explain to younger people why we like Figment so much and why we have that connection to the character. Because even though the ride now is an improvement over the second incarnation of the ride, it is such a devolution from that original ride that was so good. It had Dreamfinder on his vehicle as you went around and he was continuing to move. You almost can't describe these things about how good it was before they made those changes. I have a, uh, I have a photograph of um, myself and my two brothers um, sat outside of there with the Dreamfinder and Figment that that was because there were so few um, sort of character interactions at Epcot there. Um, like, do you remember like the the Epcot bus now? Because uh, there was a couple of versions. Um, I've got some footage of us going round World Showcase, uh, which I haven't put up yet, um, as a guest on the bus, and then I've also put footage up when it became the character bus a few years later on. You know, and it, that was they were trying to get those characters more into the parks, weren't they? Which was a, it was a good idea, but riding, riding that bus around World Showcase, just to get that height, is, is, you, it's a, a very unique perspective. Much like um, the, the Skyway as well, if you're in Magic Kingdom, and I, I've got near footage of that, and you go over to sort of Tomorrowland and Fantasyland, you look down on 20,000 leagues under the sea, and you think 30 years later, there's no way a, a modern guest couldn't get that views down onto the park. It doesn't exist, which is, I think, a bit of a shame. Really, I know why it was taken away, but I think that they could have put in a, a better system to, to give that experience. That is one of the changes from when I was a kid to when I was an adult that I almost feel like it doesn't feel real that we got to do that, if that makes <laughs> any sense whatsoever. It doesn't make sense that they let you have your feet dangling over. You see how many times people's shoes fall off on Soren. Like imagine people's shoes falling off <laughs> when they're riding that and they're dropping on people's heads in Fantasyland. My 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 kid brother, um, I can hear him rattling around, and he must have been I don't know about three or four, something like that. And I'm there thinking, and he's there screaming and shouting at the people below and waving. And yeah, you do. You look back and go, how did something tragic not happen much sooner, really? But yeah, it was a it was a good time to to go there and to to, to have that that unique perspective on on the Magic Kingdom. When you go back and watch these videos, what are some of the things that just strike you about how different the parks are now? from how they were in past years, not just what attractions are there and what rides are there, but is there a vibe that's different? Are there crowd levels that are different? What are you noticing when you look back and you go, you just couldn't do this anymore? Bar the parades, I think that the parades always sort of distort things and there's a lot of people there. They will always gather to watch the parades. But when you look at the footage of you know, us wandering around um, the theme parks, there is that whole atmosphere of you're not there sort of cheek by jowl with the world and his wife, which when when I first started finding these tapes, like um, it was about a year or just over a year ago is that we're in lockdown and we're bored. So we thought, oh, we will tidy the house up. Well, you know what it's like. Um, we found the videotapes and that was the end of that. Um, and we just kept finding all these videos and we were watching 
you know, I, I managed to get them on the, my television. And you were watching things in almost disbelief of how much space there was. I know that the, the numbers have been pushed up and up and up, but you almost felt that you had the parks to yourself. Like I've got footage of just wandering into Epcot one morning and the place is empty. Animal Kingdom, empty. Um, Magic Kingdom was always sort of busy. Um, but yeah, there was that whole sort of, you say about a vibe, I think the vibe was it was very different. Um, I think nowadays the, the vibe is how many people are there holding up phones and yeah cameras, and everyone's recording everything. You look back and no one's got phones. Everyone is just there and they're just absorbing yeah the, the the park. Whereas now everyone's looking at a park through a, a little screen. It, it's that seems to be the the different sort of vibe that I get. It, it's a, it is a different thing. Little kids, they still love it. I think that, um, and it's nice for people to have those memories, but it, that's the biggest change that, that I noticed in the parks these days. And I think that's definitely a change that society overall, we're always looking at our phones now. You go to here in the United States, you go to a baseball game and people are now looking at their phones the whole time. I'm sure it's soccer or as you would call it, football out there. People right. are still looking at their phones. It definitely is a different vibe in the real world in general. But I think that there are aspects where it does add to the parks that we now have this tiny computer that everybody has with them. So you can check on dining. Sometimes you can find a dining reservation that just pops up at the last minute. You can mobile order your food and not have to wait in a ridiculously long line for something like Pecos Bill, where that would be <laughs> like when I was going, when I was a kid, just to get into Pecos Bill would take you 35, 40 minutes. And now you can just mobile order it. And when it's ready, you just walk in and you get it. So there are some advantages and disadvantages to that technology. Yeah. And then the whole sort of booking of, of fast passes that just became because of over here, because you go for such a long period of time is that you could book fast passes for the whole of your trip. So you could go there and get that done because for 10, 15 years, however it was, and you had to get the paper ticket and you'd have part of your, your group would be heading off towards um, to do sort of Pirates of the Caribbean or the Jungle Cruise. And then you'd be sending somebody else off to rush over to Space Mountain to get the fast pass. And it was that, that whole um, people running around for, for, for things like that, whereas now people just go in there and they tap on their phone. Um, and it was straightforward. What the, the future holds for, for fast pass is, uh, is a bit up in the air, I know. But um, yeah, it, it was, I, I do like fast pass. I, I hope it doesn't get you know, too expensive, shall we say. You mentioned that you do have some videos of other things, not just the Walt Disney World theme parks, including going over to California and visiting Disneyland. What are some things that you noticed have changed over the years at Disneyland? What are some of the things that you really miss from the old times? And what are some of the things you think got better? Disneyland, um, my Disneyland videos are some of my most popular videos uh, on my channel, which is good to see. One of my most popular videos is actually of the original uh, California Adventure and how that park has completely changed. Um, and I know that there are people that, that didn't like the original sort of theming, and I suppose if you're a local, do you really want to be going into a theme park based around where you live? I can understand that, but from somebody that lives, you know, seven, 8,000 miles away, I was all for it. And uh, that whole Paradise Pier area was fantastic. Um, I, I love Disneyland, it's, that, it's compact, you get that that feeling that um, Disney World is is very immersive. Whereas I found Disneyland wasn't. You could hear all this road noise, but it was so, such a sweet park to to visit. Um, and I remember we, like the first time we went and we walked up um, Main Street USA. I had been in 1990. My other half hadn't been before, and she just walked up and she just says. I can't believe how small their castle is. <laughs> and we were like, yeah, um, okay, yeah, it's a, it's a small castle. But it was, you had that feeling of that 
that presence of of Walt Disney. You know, he'd been to that park, which the Magic Kingdom doesn't doesn't have. And also, like, is that there's so many rides crammed into to Disneyland that that is the thing that that I find amazing is that in that small area they have just managed to squeeze so much in. That is such an astute observation because I feel like with Walt Disney World, they know they have so much space that they don't have to utilize it as well, that they can waste some space every once in a while. But because they have to be so economical over at Disneyland because they're just so limited, it almost forces the Imagineers to get creative. You get rides like the Alice in Wonderland ride where it's a two level ride and you're coming out on the roof. And like you said, they just cram so much into such a small amount of space. And because they don't have to do that at Walt Disney world, I think we do miss out on a little bit of creativity because sometimes necessity is the mother of invention. So when you have a limited space, you have to find a way to put a great attraction in that limited space. If you have limitless space, you can just do basically whatever comes to your mind. You can, which, and, and I completely agree, and that is one of the mysteries that I've had with the removal of the great movie ride. That was a classic ride, and it was, they could have put Mickey and Minnie's anywhere in that park. That park is a small park. You know, they could have put more in there. I know they're, they're eating into the, the, the car park, but... They could have done a lot more with that and not taken away that that classic attraction. Um, one of the things that comes up that people speak to me a lot about is the sorcerer's hat and the, the debate on whether that was good or, or not. But to me, I love walking there. You see the Chinese theater, you go in there and the great movie ride was um, that and the backlot tour were just two absolute classic rides that as, as people of our age, we went on those again and again and again. We love those rides. And the younger people, they'll never experience that sort of wonder that was there. They'll have different things. They've got Star Wars. I, I get all of that. And they've got Toy Story Land. But I think that that's one of the things that when I go to um, the studios, that's what I miss. So I understand absolutely everything you say there with it. I do feel that there are a lot of reasons that have very little to do with the actual theme parks that led to that decision. Obviously, all the licensing rights for all of the movies and trying to figure out all of that stuff was obviously a pain. But I do want to say, I know you said earlier in the episode that you haven't done Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. Nope. I assure you, you are going to love it. And awesome. I just love to tell this little story because it opened like a week and a half before the parks closed. Yep. And I was at Hollywood Studios. I met up with a friend there, and this was, I think it was Thursday the 12th of March. I was about to leave, and I looked, and Mickey and Minnie's was listed as an 80-minute wait. And I'm an annual pass holder now. I never wait 80 minutes for a ride. But I'm like, you know what? I haven't done it yet. It opened last week. I'm going to get in line. I know that I can come back anytime and do it, but I'm just going to do it right now. I got into line. By the time I rode the ride and got off of it, Disneyland announced they were going to be closing. Major League Baseball announced they were going to be suspending play. The NBA announced they were going to be suspending play. That was while I was in the queue for <laughs> Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. So I finally got to ride it that first time, and it ended up being my only time riding it until the parks reopened. So I was very happy that I had made that decision to give it a ride. I got to see the pre-show that didn't reopen until very, very recently. Yeah, that's right. And that day, and you're riding Mickey and Minnie's, um, we're sat in the pub yeah, having a couple of drinks, um, and we're supposed to fly out two days later to go to Disneyland. And on my phone flashes up, yeah, everything's closing down. And we're going, hang on, we're, we're flying out in, in two days' time. Um, and, yeah, it was the, the whole of, of that whole trip just got scrapped. Thankfully, the, the Disney sort of, uh, they looked after us. We got a complete refund on 
on everything. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, we, we've still not we're still not allowed back into uh, into the US. Um, hopefully soon. I'm I'm due to be there for uh, uh, the the first of October for the the anniversary. So uh, fingers crossed that uh, that the borders will reopen soon, please. <laughs> So in addition to Walt Disney World and Disneyland, you say you have some video from Busch Gardens. I know I saw that you recently posted something from Busch Gardens. You have some Kennedy Space Center video on your site. Why don't you talk a little bit more about not just Disney, but what are some other videos that you have on your site? Um, I have several videos from um, Halloween Horror Nights. I think I've got 11 different videos. Um from there in Orlando. Uh, they are also very popular um, and they, they sort of stretch. So uh, from 2000 to about 2007, I think I went five or six years. Um, I've got full video of the, the Bill and Ted shows um, right up until YouTube became a thing. Um, and in 2007, I was stopped from recording. So I don't know that one. Um, I, 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 you, I looked at it and I've got literally about two minutes at the start, and then somebody comes up and taps me and just says, you can't film, and that was the end of that. Uh, but I have previous years. Um, I've got a great walk around of Islands of Adventure from 2000. How much has that part changed in, in 20 years? It, it feels almost flat because they're obviously now you've got uh, the Velocicoaster and Harry Potter, and it's sort of grown in, in height, whereas back then you had sort of the Hulk on one side, Julian Dragons on the other, and there was almost a void in the middle of that part where you go in there now, and it's it's really really changed. Um, I've got quite a few um, Sea World videos. Obviously, Sea World doesn't really do the sort of um, the, the the shows anymore. It's more of a meet and greet from what I can gather um, that are popular. I've got the Spider Man show from Universal uh, Hollywood, um, which is a bit of a, a weird show. If you haven't checked that out. You like Spider-Man, it's a strange show, but it's, it's good. And the, the, the Backlot Tour at um, Universal Studios Hollywood, which is, again, another one of my popular videos, because that, again, that's changed quite a bit. Probably I've got some footage from, from New York, which I haven't put up. Um, so, yeah, there, there's some other yeah, things to come, I would say, over the next probably six months, which is uh, hopefully be of interest to your, uh, your listeners. And of course, you mentioned coming down for the 50th anniversary of Walt Disney World. And there are so many changes that are coming along with that anniversary. So many rides they're looking to open here. So many shows that are changing. As somebody who follows the changes in the parks as much as you do, basically, that's the whole purpose of your YouTube channel is to cover these changes that have happened in the theme parks. What are some of them that you're really excited to see how they turn out as changes? I've seen footage from of Tron. Um, I really can't wait to ride that. Um, Ratatouille, that would be an interesting ride. Um, I've, again, I've watched footage of that from Paris. Um, and I think it's, it's things like what the castle looks like, because uh, I think that's going to be, yeah, very special. They're putting all these new lights on at... Um, the uh, Spaceship Earth, and I think that that's going to add um, a, a unique factor to that. I don't know whether you were a fan of the wands. Yeah, they, they again, were more controversial things from 20 years ago. I quite like the 2000 wand. I wasn't particularly uh, fond of the, uh, the the replacement, but there we go. Um, and also to see like Harmonious um, Enchantment. Um, I'm not sure when they're going to start running parades again but i'm hoping that the magic kingdom gets a a really great parade um whether it'll be this year i don't know due to sort of where we are with the the pandemic um but yeah i i, I like to see how the parks evolve over time i don't like to think of the park as being a 20th century museum they, they have to evolve they they have to change you said for with with the times so of what sort of the the newer generations are looking forward to and yeah it, it's it's an exciting time and there are some people like us who loved the parks so much in the 80s and the 90s and we might still keep going back a lot if they stayed like that but i don't think most people would 
if they didn't change as much as they change now, people would go once, they would experience for a week, maybe they would take two weeks and really do a lot, and then they'd never have to go back again. So it is these new things. It's Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. It's Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. It's Tron. It's Guardians of the Galaxy roller coaster. All of those things are the things that keep people wanting to go back and experiencing these parks again. Yes, could we ride Ellen's Energy Adventure from now (laughs) until the end of time? We probably could do that. But I like having new things to experience in the parks. Even as somebody who loved the parks the way they were, I do love that they keep giving us new stuff so that it doesn't get stale. My my only reservation about Guardians of the Galaxy will be is that you'll be on a high-speed roller coaster, and sometimes in Ellen's, it was just quite nice to just chill out and have a bit of a nap. (laughs) It was a 45-minute experience (laughs) from start to finish, so it definitely was a lot. It took a bunch out of your day, as a matter of fact, if you would ride that ride. Mm, But I say, that's that's one of the funniest things, is that who thought we're going to put in a 45-minute ride, like, in in a theme park? Because, you know, they weren't even open that long, were they? Sort of hours-wise back then. So, uh, no, uh, it was a a strange thing. But but I, I I did enjoy it. As an Englishman, I have to get out of the heat sometimes. You know, it's I'm not, I'm not designed for uh, Florida weather. So we do like to talk about the theme parks. We talk about Walt Disney World a lot. We talk about Disneyland a lot on this show. But it is Tall Guy Talks Travel, so we like to talk a lot of different travel destinations. And you are from the United Kingdom. When everything returns to some semblance of normalcy, if somebody from the United States who listens to this show is going to have a week, maybe a week and a half, and they decide, I want to visit the UK. I want to see what the UK has to offer. That's the trip I'm going to take next. What are some things that you think they need to see to get a really good UK experience? They need to come into London, do three or four days, and hit the, the main attractions. Yeah, Parliament. Big Ben, yeah, all that sort of great stuff from uh, National Lampoons, uh, European yeah. Vacation, but also go to and then get a car, go down, check out Stonehenge, and travel around. Like you think that England is the same size as Florida broadly, um, but to come here and you know, if you go sort of thirty miles each way, you'll get people who've got varying accents. This is it's a it's a very highly sort of densely populated country um, and once you get out of London you can check out things like the the Norfolk Broads and go on canals come down to the coast um, go into go to Wales which is lovely they've got mountains there um, and then you can go up and sort of um, check out there's a lot of history if you like castles and things like that we've got more history than you know you can you can shake a stick at um, where, where I live, uh, we've, we've got a lot of friends in the States, and uh, my, my town was uh, formed in uh, 972. That's not 1972, that's 972. It's, a, you know, it's, it's that whole kind of um, time, if you like the history. Um, yeah, you can come, come here. It's, it's a good time. Um, hopefully, yeah, when, when things get back to normal, um, I can do more traveling. Um, I did the last sort of sort of 18 months i haven't been anywhere whereas in 2019 i went to six different countries uh, i travel around europe quite a lot um with, with work but going to different types of places so it's not necessarily beaches sometimes it's sort of out of the way sort of cities and you get to go to i went to a place like bilbao or to frankfurt places like this which are not necessarily touristy places um but nice to go and visit and see other 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 cultures it, it's a it's a nice thing to do um and yeah americans come in here yeah they would love it and, and we love to have the americans here and obviously a lot of people who listen to this show do love walt disney world disneyland universal orlando resort universal hollywood they love their theme parks they love their amusement parks do you enjoy visiting the uk amusement parks and theme parks do you think they hold up to the ones we have here in the u.s 
I was um, very fortunate um, to, to, to work at uh, Chessica World of Adventures, which is a, a, a small theme park here. It pretty much fits into the car park of the Magic Kingdom. It's <laughs> that, That's how big it is. Um, but it was, I, I lived local to there growing up. Um, yeah, they, they, they've improved a lot. A lot of them started off, that used to be a zoo. Um, and sort of, they've kind of evolved over periods of time. Um, British theme parks have a lot of great rides. So, yeah, the, in terms of, if you like doing coasters, we've got some fantastic coasters here. The, the, the theming isn't quite the same. It doesn't have that um, immersive sort of feeling that, um, that we have from sort of mainly Disney and, and Universal. I think Universal, when it's done right, like, like Harry Potter, is fantastic. There is a, a new theme park that's supposed to be being built in uh, just outside of London over the next few years. If that comes off, that will be something to, to be on a par yeah, with the States. So this was such an incredible conversation. I really appreciate you giving me your time. I really appreciate all your insights into the parks in the past. I love hearing about your thoughts on the parks in the future. So Stephen from A Life in the Parks, tell everybody how they can get a hold of you on social media and, of course, how they can check out your videos. My channel is um, A Life on the Parks. You can find it on um, on YouTube uh, and the same for Instagram. Uh, I'm A Life in the Park 1 on Twitter. Come check me out there. Um, obviously, I'd just like to say thank you very much, Rick, for uh, for hosting me. It's been a, a r- real pleasure. Nice to uh, to put a name to a face, and um, and yeah, it's been 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 really enjoyable. This has been episode twenty nine of Tall Guy Talks Travel with Rick Doherty. Always remember to contact me at Rick at ear to their travel dot com, Rick at ear to their travel dot com, or call seven two seven. 507-3123, 727-507-3123 for a free, no obligation quote on your next vacation. Like, subscribe, and comment. Share this show with your friends and make sure to join us next week on social media from Disneyland and Disney's California Adventure. Facebook.com slash ear to their Rick, Twitter.com slash Rick underscore ear. Instagram.com slash Rick Ear, the number two there, and Twitter.com slash TGTT podcast. You also don't want to miss next week's episode of the podcast when Marissa from Chicago will finally give us all the details on why she thinks Disney's Animal Kingdom is the best theme park at Walt Disney World. It is a hot take, but I think she can show her work. That's next Thursday right here on Tall Guy Talks Travel with Rick Doherty. Have a great week.